Let's seek God's help as we come to hear his word. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, recognize the greatness and the authority of your word, and we are so dependent on the Holy Spirit to receive your word. We know that any spiritual change and any spiritual growth will only result through the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And we pray that he would help, that he would draw near, and that we would see the, the greatness of our position as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless preacher and congregation together and be glorified in our receiving and hearing of your word. May we be hearers and doers of this living word for the glory of your name. Amen. Well, please turn to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. How to overcome sin. We are returning back to the passage that we looked at last week because it is a vitally important passage for us to Consider, in fact, I would argue that Colossians 3 is one of the, the key passages that needs to be outworked in church life, corporately and, of course, individually. This passage this morning demands our attention. And the great theme of union with Christ is so important that I felt it was necessary to return back to it this morning and, and see the implications of what it means to be in Christ for our lives together. How do we win the war against sin? The answer is to be spiritually minded about our union with Jesus and live out the implications of what it means to be in Christ. That's the, the big point that I want you to remember this morning. Some time ago I saw a, a cartoon where two couples were doing a, a Bible study together and one woman said, well, I haven't actually died to sin, but I did feel kind of faint once. We know that the Bible says that we, if we are believers, if we are Christians that we are dead to sin. But if we are honest, we don't feel dead to sin. Once in a while, we may feel kind of faint, but we never feel dead to it. So what does it mean, and how practical is it to be reminded that we are dead to sin? Last week, we saw that a bunch of rules and regulations, man-made rules, denying yourselves things that the Bible does not forbid, is not the way to godliness. It's the wrong kind of fuel to propel your life to Christ-likeness. Just failing and then adding more rules and stricter regulations to your life is not the way to go. Uh, Paul says that uh, these regulations, these rules, are of no value in dealing with the indulgence of the flesh. And we looked at what that meant last week. It does not work. That approach does not work. So the question is, how do I, how do you win the war against sin? Paul's answer is found in Colossians 3, 1 to 4. He mentions here that we have died with Christ, and then he adds the corresponding truth that we are raised with Christ. And then he gives the, the very challenging advice. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. In other words, we could translate that as this emphasis with the Greek tenses, K, 
keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Continually set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. There is that awful saying, is there not, that that person is too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use. That is not possible. The more full of heaven, the more Christ focused we are in our minds and in our hearts, the more use you will be to the Lord and the greater purpose you will have in this world. Paul is saying, to be more good on earth, you need to be more heavenly minded. To understand our text, we view the wider context, going back to Colossians 2.23, where the severity of the false teachers is highlighted where their rules and regulations are of no value against fleshy indulgence, as one translation says. And then Paul goes on, after our text this morning, to spell out what does it mean uh, to be full of Christ, to set your mind on things above. Well, there are things you put off, and there's a list of moral behaviors that you are to flee from, in verse 5, and then in verse 8, you've got uh, the way that we use words highlighted. We can use words in a very negative, harmful, hurtful way. And so we are to put off that kind of behavior. And then, verse 12 onwards of chapter 3, there's the dynamic of how it looks like in church life to have your mind set on things above. And uh, it is a glorious and wonderful principle to see this being outworked within church life. So that's the, the flow of our passage. Let's come back to our main point then. Firstly, as Christians, we all battle the sins of the flesh. There's a battle to fight. And it is a daily battle. We are constantly fighting against our own old selves, against the world, the flesh, and the devil. These sins are mainly what Paul has in mind when he directs us in verse 2 of Colossians 3, not to think on things on the earth. That phrase is repeated in verse 5 in the Greek text, and it spelled out what things on the earth actually are. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And then I've already highlighted the connecting verse 8, Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. It is a searching list, is it not? And we need the Lord's equipping and strength and the grace that Jesus gives us through the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul wouldn't have told us not to have our minds characterized by these sins and put them to death if they were no longer a problem for us. They are a problem for us. While a person comes to Christ and there's a radical change in them, they are brought from death to life, there are new desires in their hearts, there is still the flesh, the old man, that needs to be put to death. It is not totally eradicated. So how do we win the battle against the ongoing influence of the old nature, which, if we are honest, we all must fight against? Who is the person who will put their hand up this morning and boldly and proudly say, I no longer need to repent because I've reached this 
plane of sinless perfection. When, uh, when preachers said that if anyone ever claims that, I think it was Spurgeon, if anyone ever claims sinless perfection, throw um, a cup of cold water in their face and see how they get on. None of us are there yet. And we recognize with sorrow and grief in our hearts that we daily, moment by moment, need to come to find forgiveness as we repent. And perhaps we need to do that this morning. Maybe you've come to, to worship and you feel guilty on a heart level. You know you've sinned. You know you failed. And there is grace, mercy, and forgiveness to be received. After all, anyone in, in the world, out of anyone in the world, we should be people who emphasize the grace and pardon that is received through the Lord Jesus Christ. For we are, are great recipients of that grace as sinners who've come to Christ. So to win this battle which is waging on us, we need to understand our identity in Christ. That brings me to my second point. It is clear Paul wants us to understand, and I'm emphasizing this and perhaps repeating it, Paul wants us to understand our union with Christ means we died with Christ. Colossians 2 verse 12, we are buried with Christ in baptism. Colossians 2 verse 20, we died with Christ from the basic principles of the world. A rules-based approach to God. We've left that behind. It is we are saved by grace. We walk by grace. We live out our experience by grace. And again in verse 3 of chapter 3, he emphasizes, for you died. It's as if the, the red mark has been brought out and highlighted this great theme. You died as a believer in Christ and with Christ. The problem with this truth is that we often don't feel dead to sin. Sin feels very much alive in our own hearts. If we are honest, if I am honest, when we are tempted to sin, which is often, the old nature feels very, very much alive. There is a strong inner desire to indulge sin. The passing pleasures of sin can be very attractive to us. So what does it mean that I am dead to sin in Christ? How can this help me overcome sin? It seems to me the answer to that question is to remember that death in the Bible never means cessation of existence, but rather separation. So biblically, when someone physically dies, it's the permanent separation of soul from body. That's biblically how death is defined. I know there's different medical definitions of death. When you die physically, your soul is separated permanently from your body. To be identified with Christ in his death means I am separated from the power of flesh and from this evil world. I am now, you are now, a citizen of a new country that country of heaven. And so we are not bound to obey the old laws of the old country, this sinful world. It's like having a new passport that's stamped with the blood of Christ. A believer now is a citizen of Christ's heavenly country. We are under his reign and his rule. In this world, we are 
passing through. We are traveling home, and this world, therefore, is not our home. Now, to use a different illustration, if I may, uh, I could uh, probably take you to um, parts, certainly, of Swansea. I've not seen it in, in Portsmouth so much, but uh, parts of Swansea, maybe today, where there would be cars put up on bricks and the wheels would have been stolen from those cars. Uh, if you step on the accelerator, that car is not going to go anywhere. The wheels will spin like crazy, but the car doesn't go anywhere because it's separated from the ground by the bricks. When you're tempted to sin, your old nature may be revved up and make a lot of noise, but your position in Christ can lead you to say, my old nature died with Christ. I'm now separated from its power. It's been rendered inoperative, so it doesn't have to go anywhere. Out of our position in Christ, we can resist and overcome sin. Romans 11 verse 6 says, Likewise, you also reckon or consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's not really a matter of feeling, but it's legal, biblical fact. If we are joined to Christ by faith, we are one with him in his death. We are divorced from the old life, that tyrant of sin and Satan that tries to keep us in such bondage and slavery. We are now, praise God, married to a new husband, spiritually speaking. We died with Christ. And the flip side to that is that we're also raised up with Christ to the right hand of God. So Colossians 2, 12 and 13 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. And note again verse 1 of Colossians chapter 3. If then you were raised with Christ, continually seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Remember I briefly explained to you uh, how conditional sentences work. Uh, it is not doubting. It's not a doubting statement, but it's saying, if this is true, then this is the implication. So if I am faithfully explaining the word of God, I am preaching from the Bible. If one is true, the following must be true. And Paul here uses a conditional statement to make a very clear point. If then you are raised with Christ, that's the condition. The implication is you are therefore to continually seek those things which are above. And we realize, don't we, that if we are alive in Christ, when someone becomes a believer... It is the amazing, wonderful, gracious, powerful work of God in that person's life. It is the life of God in the soul of man, as the old Puritan said. God's mighty power imparting spiritual life and energy and power to us. We were dead in our sins. We are and now Alive in Christ, the two positions couldn't be more extreme. Salvation is not just making a decision uh, to change bad habits and to clean up our lives. 
It is, as I've said, the life of God in the soul of man. It means that we are so united to the Lord Jesus that his life, his glorious, resurrected, ascended life is our life. And we draw our life from him as the branch does from the vine. We are daily dependent upon his life, empowering us to live for the Savior. Living in union with the risen person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an incredible and amazing thing to be saved when we view it from union with Christ. You see why I've returned to it again this morning. It is so crucial. Being raised with Christ also means that all that is true of Christ is now true of us. Let me give you an illustration. Here I've got a, a simple bookmark. I put the bookmark in my Bible. What happens to the bookmark if I raise the Bible in the air? The bookmark goes up. What happens if I put the Bible on the lectern? The bookmark goes there as well. What happens if I take this Bible all the way home with me? The bookmark goes as well. Do you see what an astounding and glorious truth it is? In the Lord Jesus Christ, all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in him he is our all in all, he is our delight, our hope of heaven, our salvation, our shepherd, our prophet, priest, and king. We have been given everything that is needful and necessary for life and godliness in him. We have the exceedingly great and precious promises of God given to us that are yea and amen in Christ. That's why we began worship with that great statement from Second Peter. <coughs> We've been raised with Christ, who's now seated at the right hand of God. And we are in that position in Him. Where is Jesus this morning? He's reigning at God's right hand, the place of highest position and glory. And if you trace uh, Christ being raised at God's right hand in the scriptures, there are three key themes that come out from that statement. It's obviously a position of power. Ephesians 1, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. You can't get a higher position than the position of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is reigning till all his enemies are made his footstool. And therefore we do not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Secondly, being seated at God's right hand refers to the, the great and wonderful pardon that's found in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So there is a full and complete pardon to be found in the Lord Jesus. That is one of the most comforting things any sinner can ever hear. By this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. 
from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 10, 12 to 14. And so when the evil one accuses us, there is perfect pardon that we flee to in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, the fact that Jesus is now sitting at the Father's right hand means that we are objects of his intercession. Romans 8, 33 to 34. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who can point the finger and bring a successful accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Christ Jesus, he is when the one who died, yes, uh, who was raised and is at the right hand of God who intercedes for us. We know times of discouragement, don't we? We know times of uh, sometimes despair and, and darkness. And it's encouraging to know that family and Friends and our church are faithfully praying for us. But those prayers are, are limited. They, they come from weak, frail human beings. They, they can't pray for you constantly. But because of the fullness of the deity that's found in our Lord Jesus Christ, Colossians 2.9, he's at the Father's right hand interceding for us in our weaknesses, sympathizing, understanding. Through his finished work, they're interceding for us. So when you battle temptation or when you wrestle with discouragement, remember that you're in Christ. You shared in his death and resurrection. You're raised together to the highest position in him. And abundant and full and free pardon flows to us from that union with him. But how do we implement union with Christ in a practical way? Brings me to my third point. To win the battle against sin, constantly seek to understand and meditate upon your identity in the risen Christ. We need to understand our life is hidden with Christ in God. What does Paul mean by this? Well, he's taking first year swipe at the false teachers who were, were claiming hidden knowledge and, and secret truths that if you joined to be part of their group, they would initiate you into their cult and you would be on the inside track. Paul says... The hidden realities are not found in them. They're found in the Lord Jesus. Don't be distracted away from life and reality in him. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. There's a, a wonderful uh, statement the psalmist makes in Psalm 31 verse 20. Where David takes refuge in God from his enemies and he says this. You shall, thus speaking about the Lord, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of men. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. If our life is hidden with Christ in God, we are safe there. Another implication of the truth that our life is hidden with Christ in God is that it's to be mined and sought out as buried treasure. It is to be discovered. It is to be thought through. It is to be a, a continual pursuit of our thinking. Keep seeking the things above. Set your mind on things above. There are those two commands there in our passage and they are present imperatives. They are commands that imply you do something and you keep doing it. It suggests continual process. 
keep seeking those things, these truths, these realities, make them your focus, your aim. Now, what does that mean for you? It means, yes, tomorrow morning you have to get up and go to work. Yes, tomorrow morning you have responsibilities and, and functions and roles that you're meant to fulfill in the workplace, in the home, and within the family. Let me illustrate it like, like this. What does it mean to continually set your minds on things above? Well, last Thursday, there was a very important football game, and there were many Pompey fans that would have woken up, and the first thing they would have thought about would have been that playoff game in the evening. They would have had breakfast, got dressed, maybe gone to work on their way to work. They'd have driven there safely. They'd have been thinking about the kickoff later on that evening. During work, they would have hopefully done their work in an appropriate way. They were, their mind would have also been on what was going to be happening that evening and the implications of, of that game. Lunchtime, they may have had food, but they'd have had a conversation maybe with their friends and colleagues about what was going on. And then uh, driving to the, the game with the horrific traffic that was impending as a result of all those football fans going to the stadium, they'd have driven safely to the stadium, but would have been thinking continually about what was going to happen. Do you see how it works for the believer who thinks about greater, eternal, far more significant realities than a football game? You go about your daily duties and responsibilities. You do your work in a consistent way. You have responsibilities at home and in, in the family and within the church environment. And, and those things aren't always necessarily overtly spiritual things, but there's a focus and intent of mind and heart that says, I'm going to continually set my mind on things above. I'm going to think about my Savior. I'm going to make deliberate choices to discipline my mind and not be distracted and, and not be so absorbed in this world that I forget about my Savior. We are to labor for food that does not perish. We are to seek first the kingdom of God. It's all tying into what Paul is commanding us to continually to do. Continually set your minds on things above. Have your, all, your whole attitude characterized by these things. Make those repeated choices to think on Christ and on things which are above. It requires prayerful discipline. It requires the aid and help of the Holy Spirit. But there is a responsibility that we have to live these things out, to think about them so that they affect our lives. And then when Christ, who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What an amazing truth that is. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet appeared what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. Friends, let me conclude. Years ago, a plastic surgeon noticed some very interesting things about the people uh, whose faces he'd operated on. For some, the operation resulted in immediate and lasting changes in their personalities. People who had been embarrassed by some disfigurement became more confident and outgoing after the, the problem was fixed. He then went on to report that there was a second group of individuals who insisted that the surgery had made no difference 
to their appearance whatsoever. The surgeon would show photographs to them before and after with the, dis the disfigurement removed. But these people still insisted, sometimes aggressively, that their faces were no different. They refused to believe the truth and went out living their lives just as they had before, being dominated by the, dis the disfigurement, which no longer existed. Their lives, were, their lives were not changed because they didn't believe the truth had taken place. Now, what I'm not saying is, oh, think positive, and you'll be holy. I'm not saying that. But there is a command here to continually fix our minds upon Christ and those things which are above. Believe the identity you have and live that out. All that is true of Christ is now true of us. And so there is the engaging of the minds. There is a connection between Christ dwelling in us and Colossians 3 Verse 16, the word of Christ dwelling richly in us. And so we allow the word of God to fill our minds and change our hearts. And then, in closing, here, here's a question for you. What do you think of Jesus? Followed by another question. Do you love him more not as much, but more, as you did this time last year. If not, then do not go to sleep tonight before you pour out your heart to him and beg that the Holy Spirit would work in your heart, uh, that indeed you would return to your first love. Maybe you are cold, maybe you are drifting this morning. Well, don't stay in that position as a believer. What an unhappy position that is to be in. Have a fervent love for the Savior and commit to know him in a deeper and more real way and pray for the Spirit of God's help there. Never has anyone sought him in vain. Seek the Lord and he shall be found. Return to him and he will return to you. He is gracious and merciful and desires intimacy and fellowship with you. Set your mind upon him and continually seek the Savior. And so to close, let's sing 642. May the mind of Christ, my Savior, live in me from day to day by his love and power controlling all I do and say. 642.